Real-time schema dis discovery. So a little bit of a disclaimer here <clears throat> is that uh, when I first started working on this talk, um, was it like a month ago or so, uh, I was hot off the heels of uh, basically being really stoked about like how we did all this. And it was really, really fast. And uh, it was, well, it's it took a lot of, a lot of work to actually implement it and stuff. And I was really happy about it. And I really wanted to talk about it and show it to the world. Um, and then the closer this conference came, <clears throat> the more I realized that, like, well, you probably shouldn't do this. <laughs> like, so this talk has turned into, like, at first it was like, look at this. This is so friggin' awesome. And it's turned into, uh, maybe you shouldn't do this. And this is the result of, uh, like, what happens if you do have to do this? And then what is probably a better alternative than doing this? Um, so anyway, that's what you're going to get. So <clears throat> let's get going with this. Um, I'm going to use... Arrows. Okay, the most important slide, actually, it's about me. Uh, me, myself, and I. I am Daniel. Um, I am the CTO and co-founder for StreamDoll, and we're basically like a, think of it as like a data dog for streaming. <clears throat> so I do like all kinds of uh, anomaly detection, monitoring of the actual data. So like not metrics, right? There's the data itself uh, that's on the bus. So. But prior to that, I did a ton of time in software and systems. And when I say systems, I mean like I uh, was actually in data centers for like 10 plus years doing integrations engineering. So lots of super weird stuff like uh, working with generators and uh, SNMP integration, all kinds of just weird, weird stuff. And it was great um, as a result of that. So um, for the past 10 years, I've been writing mostly backend code. I do um, Go primarily. Pretty sweet. Um, and uh, generally speaking, I mostly talk about event-driven stuff and uh, lots of event sourcing and all kinds of just generally fairly complex distributed system architectures and stuff. That's kind of like my jam. But the good news is that you don't have to listen to that nonsense today. Um, I am going to be talking about schemas instead. Um, and usually I talk about, yeah, about async stuff. And Fun story, fun fact is that I am from Portland, Oregon right now, but I'm originally was born and raised in Riga, Latvia. And, you know, Latvians, yeah, and whatever. Anyway, um, and previous to that, I was yeah, at New Relic, uh, Community, DigitalOcean, Envision, a uh, few other companies um, that may be semi-recognizable at least. So basically focused on a lot of high throughput and stuff. So, all right. So, uh why are we even talking about uh, schema discovery in the first place? If I know how to push buttons. Uh, well, we need to establish a little bit of context for all this in the first place. So, <clears throat> so let's go with that. So everybody probably knows what a schema is, but let's just get that out there. So it's a predefined and agreed upon structure and layout for data, right? Makes sense. Nothing too terribly difficult. So uh, why is it actually important? Well, uh, the data is going to be used by many teams, and everyone needs access to this data. And the thing is that, uh, well, of course, data engineers need access to the data. That's pretty obvious. You're going to build, uh, you could use it for machine learning or for various other analytics purposes and so on. But the thing is, as we're moving further and further, um, it's not just the data engineers who care about this. Uh, there's going to be several other teams that are going to care about this stuff too. Like uh, as a company evolves, <clears throat> more than likely the result, the artifact of this data, especially if it's well-defined in the first place, the, it's going to be consumed by developers, right? And uh, if you go further, it's also going to be like, consumed by platform and DevOps folks as well because that's the source of truth potentially, right? So establishing a schema then is kind of like an important thing because it's not just you that actually will care about it in the first place, right? So, well, what happens without a schema? Well, um, the most obvious one is there's going to be incidents and outages. Like when there's no schema, well, nobody knows what happened upstream and downstream gets affected, right? Uh, pretty sensible thing. I mean, uh, that, this happens all the time, nonstop, uh, that somebody changes something and somebody gets affected by it as well. So it is the most obvious one. Uh, I think a horrible part of this is, of course, is duplicate, dupl duplicated effort, right? Because uh, everyone is going to have their own idea of what it means you know, to sanitize and to normalize data. Everyone's going to do it kind of differently. Um, and then, well, where do you, who do you trust in the first place? That sort of thing. Um, it's, it's just a 
just generally, well, uh, waste of time, right? That's all it is ultimately. And it all spawns from the fact that, well, there is no schema in the first place. So, uh, put in some schema examples and stuff, but like uh, the most obvious one is like just JSON. Um, there are some standards out there, right? Like there's like cloud events and there's JSON schema as well. Cloud events is, uh, uh, it's really geared towards, uh, not really towards data engineering, but it totally could be as well. It would be totally fine. The All the stuff that you see here, which is like metadata, it's, uh, Honestly, it's not as important as simply the thing which talks about type and data. The type is going to you know, indicate what is actually going to be inside the data, right? Um, oh man, that's tiny. But anyways, there's Avro. If you're doing Java, then Avro is a fantastic idea altogether because it's been so established forever and ever already. But it is a binary encoding ultimately, which is super awesome and it's strongly typed, has all the primitives, has complex types as well, yada, yada. Um, it's Quite okay, uh, specifically if you're in Java. If in other languages, like, eh, it's, it's okay. Um, but if you're in other languages, um, if you're in, well, anything, if you, and if you don't care about it being Java specific, well, then it's probably Protobuf. Um, and Protobuf is like kind of the, the latest iteration of, uh, from Google, right, uh, to basically simplify schemas and formats, essentially. Um, but it has the same thing. It has all the primitives, has enums, has complex types. You can reference complex types from different places. Uh, it has, yeah, arrays, maps, all that sort of stuff. Um, pretty obvious. Cool. So the conclusion from all this is, is that having the schema is like a really foundational co component. Um, it's a really important piece, really, right? So, um, and if you don't have a schema, well, there's going to be tons of wasted engineering effort. And uh, ultimately, there's going to be outages, right? Like it's just things are going to, there's going to be some sort of incidents in the first place. This happens all the time, nonstop, even, and that's the thing that like it already happens with schemas as well, but the the volume of them is going to be dramatically smaller if there is actually at least a schema. Um, so what we ultimately want is like to be able to resolve this thing, and we're getting to this, this is the point, this is still the context by the way. Um, but we're almost there at the end so of the context. So you want to define a schema, right? Um, but there's a problem here, is that uh, if you just define a schema, if you're just a team, there's still no source of truth, right? Like as in team A may have defined a schema, that's fantastic, but uh, team B doesn't actually know about the schema and they're still gonna do their own thing. Cool, so uh, the step two would be that you would establish like a schema update process, right? And you would say, you would basically send out a company email or a company like an all Slack message, and there's a bunch of architects that decide that like, oh, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do schemas this way. Um, but uh, there's still a possibility that somebody's not gonna follow it. Right? It's not like this massive. Uh, uh, you haven't maybe realized yet that it, it requires a serious, like seriously wide adoption across the entire org, and it's a really, really like difficult thing to do in the first place, especially if you have a super large org. And here's the final part of the context. This is a, this is how you might arrive at the conclusion that like, you know, what we need is real-time schema discovery, right? So in other words, instead of having to go through all this stuff of establishing, uh, well, establishing a protobuf schema or an avro schema or whatever schema, it doesn't matter, flat buffer or something, whatever you end up using, even thrift, let's say, you decide like, oh, it's just going to be so much easier to just do a real-time like real schema discovery. Well, and that's how we're here. Um, there is a reason why there's a smiley face with a little teardrop there, is because uh, actually it's not just 17 steps, it could be like, I don't know, 65 steps really, or like maybe 122. Um, so. I will do a little bit of context here. Like, so, like our company, um, the thing that we do is we ingest a ton of data. And uh, the first thing that we did, like, was we have first class protobuf support, first class Avro, Thrift, blah, 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 all these awesome formats. They're all fantastic, all right? Um, but it means that it, it's really easy for us to build a system for that because basically we're saying, like, hey, you give us your, you know, give us your schemas. And we know exactly how to decode the stream then, um, like, you know, of whatever events that you're sending us. Uh, the reality of it, though, is that uh, there's, like, a really tiny percentage of people that are actually doing protobuf, like, as a first-class thing. People are using JSON. It makes sense. JSON is super easy. So 
Uh, we couldn't have a platform that is not able to accept JSON. That is ridiculous, right? Like, so uh, we, being a bunch of software engineers, being like, yeah, what's the big deal? Like, we're just going to write this. Like, I don't know how to write an ASD parser. It's not a big deal. I could do this. Um, so we did, and uh, it's not great. It's, it's actually pretty hard. <laughs> like, it was really, really difficult, and especially when we're talking about real time. So what we're going to go through is kind of like a distilled... Um, almost step-by-step, step, skipping some steps, uh, process of what it actually took us to, to do this sort of a thing. So uh, we're going to go through that. So let's go. How do you actually do this? Well, uh, the first thing is going to be that you're going to need to determine and nominate some sort of a source of truth, right, of your, where all your data is at. Um, so that doesn't mean that, like, oh, you need to figure out, uh, you need to say, um, the, these, I don't know, these mail servers or FTP servers and so on, that these are the sources of truth? No, they're not. They're, they're just sources of data, but ultimately your source of truth, you're just going to pack it all into Kafka probably, and then from there you're going to do the whole entire process, right? Like uh, re-encoding the data or like sanitizing and normalizing it, and finally you actually uh, create, you know, you, know you, you encode all this stuff. So cool, so you're establishing a source of truth. It's that's not really terribly hard, especially if it's a smaller org, not really a big deal. Um, <clears throat> okay, next. Uh, then you're going to write a service that will consume from Kafka. Well, everyone's probably done that. If you write back-end code, it's not that big of a deal. You just write a service, whatever. Um, this is nothing, really. Uh, pretty simple. Then it gets a little trickier. Then you're going to decide, okay, like, okay, now we need to parse JSON in the first place. Well, parsing JSON and accessing different parts, it's not really terribly difficult. Like, there are plenty of libraries in every single language that are able to parse JSON fairly quickly, but all of a sudden you'll start, like, paying attention to, like, oh, well, so we use Go. Uh, so for Go, we, for instance, looked at, like, gJSON. How fast does that actually parse JSON in the first place? Um, for instance, you do not, like, the way you parse the type of libraries that you would choose would have, you'd want to read the source code of how they actually do it in the first place. You would want to, for instance, have character by character like reads instead of them actually building an entire AST tree, what they think it should be like, right? So you're basically going to start paying attention to these sort of things and you're going to start paying attention to performance uh, of things in, in the first place. So this part already is kind of rough. Um, and ultimately the artifact here is you need to come up with some sort of a schema format, right? Something that is going to define that, like, this JSON contains, uh, you know, this and this field, it has this type, blah, blah, blah. And you want it to be in something that's probably neutral, like language neutral, so maybe you would choose Parquet. Um, Parquet does not actually have a direct output of what it's supposed to look like, so you're going to have to come up with that too, of what it actually is going to be represented at, because uh, you're going to want to save it somewhere, probably, right? Like, the state of... What does the schema of this data come in as? So, all right. So um, at that point, you're, we're all very smart, and we all work with distributed systems. Then you're going to have a, a situation that you have this service, and uh, you're going to be ingesting data from all over the place. Um, you probably have a bunch of services that are horizontally scaled. You have like you know five, six, ten replicas of this thing. Everybody gets basically their own vision of what something looks like. Um, so. Think of it as this. Think of it as like one service receives something that says age 13 that's an integer, and all of a sudden another service receives, like at that same exact moment, let's just say, well, within milliseconds or whatever, nanoseconds, receives another event, and that one says age 13 in quotes. <laughs> and that's a ginormous problem, right, in the first place, because that means that there's a conflict. So now you need to figure out conflict resolution. And that right there is going to be horrible because what we're talking about, we're not talking about a single service doing conflict resolution. We're talking about a dis like it needs to be a distributed conflict resolution process, right? So you're going to more than likely create some sort of an election process. You're going to have services that actually will basically send out, this is what we think is like, you know, this is the real schema. Then somebody else is going to say, well, I think it's like this. And then you need to basically have something that will say, well, actually, it's both of those, you know? And it needs to be fast. And it needs to happen, like if we're talking about real time, that a real time basically kind of falls apart after one second, right? Um, so it has to be sub-second. And uh, if you're dealing with any sort of high throughput, so let's say like 100 messages even a second, it's not even high throughput, but let's just say that, uh, 
you'd probably want to generally batch stuff. Like you'd probably want to batch at least for a couple of seconds because otherwise you're just going to have so much chatter and, and stuff for like for all the schema election stuff. Um, anyways, yeah, so you're going to go through all that. You're going to implement this thing and it's going to be pretty rough. Um, I put in learn raft in there. So uh, raft being a consensus protocol or consistent consensus algorithm for distributed systems. So more than likely you'd use that, but maybe, you know, I don't know, if you know member list or something and you know gossip as well and you know some other things. But point is like probably a good idea for you to be like a distributed systems nerd. Like there's no other way around this really. You're going to have to figure out how to do this sort of a thing. It's, and it's going to be rough. Um, so from all those other things that were above, I mean, writing an AST parser at this point, like a, the, for JSON, it's not that big of a deal. Like this part is going to be tough, <laughs> like for sure. Um, so... Oh yeah, there's the service, of course, that you're going to write. Now you have, you know, the library that you wrote. Then you're going to put it into a distributed service that also needs to be distributed as well. You don't want to just have a single point of failure. So at that point, when you have, you know, if you have a like a distributed election service, then that means that you'd probably need to have some sort of a way to elect one of those nodes as a leader. So now you have leader election as well that you need to start thinking about. Um, so, um, oh, what do you do with unresolvable conflicts? So the, the, the uh, scenario that I presented where you have uh, age that everybody thinks is supposed to be an integer, but now it actually is a string, well, that's an uh, unresolvable conflict. So that means that you're probably going to have to come up with some sort of a way to basically create a dead letter queue. Um, dead letter queues, besides just basically throwing stuff to the side, um, since this is supposed to be a real-time like schema discovery service or a process, really, you probably want to have like a really legit DLQ process as well. So more than likely, you're going to instrument and create that entire thing. It's a literally a completely separate project altogether, right? Um, and uh, yeah, throughout this whole entire process, you're I I would guarantee it. You're going to patent something. <laughs> like so you're going to discover something that is so ridiculously hard um, that you're going to end up patenting something. And uh, we did that. We did exactly that. We came to the conclusion that, like, well, the way we do schema election and stuff, uh, it's pretty intense. Like, we, like, I don't read, like, white papers, but I had to. <laughs> like, for this thing, I actually had to, like, learn Raft properly. Like, what happens under the covers for this thing? And that... It's just a lot. Um, and actually, as I was writing this list, this was the point in time when I was like, mm, I think this talk is kind of going to a different direction. <laughs> like, instead of being like, wow, this is so awesome. Everybody should do this. No, like, mm, it's not a good idea, really. Um, so, um, yeah, we did all this. And uh, here's, the, here's the thing is that uh, tons of other people have done it as well. And uh, Sorry about that. It looks weird, but whatever. Like you get it. Snowflake is there, and Databricks is there, and everybody's there, including even us as well. Um, but there's a little tiny thing here. Is that a? Uh, uh, so first off, this is schema inference. That's really the synon like like it's synonymous with that. Um, it's schema inference, and uh, if you search for schema inference across all these uh, across all these vendors. They all support it. They all mention schema inference, but the thing is, every single one of them have edge cases. They're all over the place. In some cases, the edge case is horrible. Like, uh, we won't name any names, but when data comes in and it has some sort of an unresolvable conflict on schemas, things just stop. <laughs> and uh, that's when you have potentially an outage and yada, yada, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, here's the thing. Um, can't really talk about... Uh, Everyone, but uh, I assume uh, everyone had a pretty rough time with this. Um, and the reason those edge cases exist is because uh, there's just so many of them. There's just tons and tons of them. And uh, based, like you're basically choosing, just like uh, with the cap theorem, if anybody's familiar with that, like uh, you have to choose really two out of that. Um, so anyway, uh, in our case, I can't like speak speak to what it was like for AWS or for, you know, Snowflake or something like that to like uh, to, to figure out uh, or to do uh, schema inference. But for us, we're a scrappy little startup. We had uh, 11, 11 folks in our, at our company and uh, all of our all of our engineers are principal engineers, every single one of them. And uh, initially when we started this, uh, yeah, it took us about six months to actually build this thing uh, with two people, I think. And uh, then later on, it took us about whatever it says there, but it took us about another four months to get it into prod. 
And we thought like, ah, oh, this is good. Everything is working great. Um, and then after that, uh, it took us another three months to basically deal with the fallout of what happened when we were like, yeah, this is good. <laughs> like, it's totally working in prod because yeah, it's kind of working in prod, but not really. Like, uh, there's like customers would complain about random things. It was just, uh, honestly, it was pretty huge mess altogether. So, um, and then since then, this is still a reality right now. Um, more than likely, this will happen again in like uh, next month. There's going to be somebody messaging us saying that like, hmm, there's this weird thing. I don't see this event in here. And then we'll probably go through like basically a week of troubleshooting, being trying to prove this person wrong, and then realizing that like, well, no, nah, never mind. This is a bug. <laughs> like this still sucks. Like this is something with our district, like you know, with our process uh, of like election process. Maybe some messages got dropped somewhere. That's what, it's just uh, yeah, it's a big old thing. So the reality of that, right, is like I, I just wanted to put it down into numbers and stuff. Is that uh, so two principal level engineers, a uh, little over a year. Uh, let's say minimum 200k a year salary um, for both of them, so uh, it's going to get kind of expensive. And then there's going to be probably at least two senior level engineers who are going to be working on this stuff for about let's say like nicely, let's say eight hours, you know, per month. Um, in this case, uh, just you know, ongoing support, just troubleshooting things, trying to figure out like what went wrong. Ultimately, the principal engineers probably get called into this as well again. Uh, somebody who actually knows how this was implemented in the first place to prove something and so on. So basically, it's just like it's a ton of effort into something that you already think is great. Like, uh, and it's, I mean, you have patents for it, so how could it not be great? Um, so anyway. The end, of the end result really is, right, is that we spent, well, about 500K or so on this entire endeavor of trying to support real-time schema discovery. Um, and since then, this is just theory, really, but I think, like, it's probably somewhere around, like, 40K a year that we're spending on this. Uh, because, I mean, it literally happened, like, two days ago. Like, we had a message from a customer uh, that basically said that there's some sort of a, some data that they didn't expect to see was actually there. And then we had to prove that like, well, that's actually totally normal. And it's not normal. No, <laughs> like the data shouldn't even even been there. It should have just been dropped in the first place. So all kinds of weird stuff like that happens all the time. So I guess, yeah, the, the point of this is that um, no matter how cool it is and no matter how great you think you are, especially if you're like a software developer or you've got like serious chops and you're not afraid of digging into like really, really complex problems, uh, you still shouldn't do it probably. Um, but it is a probably, because there are some cases where you still need to do it. But uh, if you end up deciding that this is a thing that you absolutely must do, like, well, it's a different conversation. We should probably just talk about it. And like, I'll be more than happy to provide whatever you need for this thing and try to dissuade you, because it's, it's really bad. So um, I guess, yeah, uh, the, instead, you can go around all of this, and you can basically skip all of this and just say, if there's a choice, rather, right, um, that you can basically establish uh, establish a schema. And uh, when I first wrote, like, specifically this slide, I was just like, ah, I don't know how people are going to take this. Um, you know, trying to establish, like, a proper foundational schema. But here's the thing. Like, two days ago, we had Chad, who talked about data quality, and guess what was the first thing on that slide? It was a schema. And... Uh, that made me really, really happy because uh, now I'm able to say, like, yeah, you should establish a schema. There are other people that are way better than me that have already said the same thing. So here we are talking about protobuf and establishing a schema. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so for those, uh, has anybody used protobuf? Like, uh, all right, okay, all right. So some folks. So never mind all you nerds. Um, we're going to focus on everybody else who hasn't done protobuf in the first place. So, um, yeah, so protobufs, right, are Google's uh, language neutral, platform neutral, extensible mechanism for serializing, so encoding, decoding, structured data. Basically, like XML, just not crappy. Um, sorry if anybody's using XML. That's, yeah, that's your situation. I'm sorry. Um, but it's basically like that, right? And it's structured, and ultimately, when you encode it, um, it's, it turns into binary, and it's really fast as a result of that. It's much smaller. Uh, there's tons of benefits to it, right? Um, and the thing is, it's 
totally doable. It's very readable in general. Like so, the example right there is on the right, where like there is a base message, and the base message includes, you know, it has like an action that's a string, could be an enum or something like that as well. Then it has a complex type, which is a subcommand, and the subcommand is defined right right on top, right? So it's a uh, pretty straightforward. So <clears throat> and in general, with Protobuf, what you do is uh, you compile it, quote unquote, but really, I mean, you're not really compiling anything because uh, you're really just generating code. That's all it is. Uh, like you're basically taking those protos and you're going to generate a bunch of code in whatever language you use, right? Like whatever part, part uh, whatever stack you have. So whether it's like Java or TypeScript or uh, Golang or whatever, um, you would just basically run this tool called, called Proto C that is going to compile the, the pro, dot protos, like which basically contain all your definitions, and the artifact that it's going to create are going to be a bunch of pb.go or .java files and so on, um, so the, which will contain uh, basically the data structures, right, that are representative of the protobufs, so of your protobuf schemas. Um, in this case, I have uh, Docker, like I'm just basically running the compiler, the Proto C compiler through Docker in the first place. Um, it's kind of old. Like this is a super old screenshot in the first place. But uh, this is generally the generally what you're probably going to do, especially like if you're doing it like CI or something like that. So um, cool. And yeah, the example right here is of uh, well, what does this actually look like? All right. So. Uh, on the left, you have the actual protobuf definition, the same one we saw before, and on the right are the structs that it generates. It, it will generate all kinds of accessor methods and all kinds of extra stuff in there as well, but the meat and potatoes here is, uh, are those two structs, essentially. That's, that's what you're after, is to have a very clear, defined path, right? Like as to what this protobuf is actually supposed to be in there. Um, well, that said, you're still going to need, like if you want to do some sort of semantic validation, that's that's a separate thing altogether. But at least at this point, you already have some sort of validation, which is it is impossible to even get into that situation where something came in that's a string and now is becoming an int. There's literally no way for that to even happen. Right, like, uh, and that's 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 the power really of of choosing something like protobuf. So, um, and the general flow for this really right is going to be that's the thing. Like, people just throw out stuff and they say like, ah, let's just do this, just do replays. Like, <laughs> you don't know how, but anyway. So with the protobuf stuff, um, the thing that's worked for us, and I've done protobuf for the past I don't know how many years now, probably like ten years or so. And it has always worked really well when you just simply put the protobuf definitions or the protos inside a GitHub repo. That's it. <laughs> and then everything happens from the GitHub repo, right? Uh, meaning that, uh, let's see, so your repo is ultimately going to be governed by essentially all the stakeholders, right? So people who are who care about proto, or they don't have to care about protobuf, they have to care about the organization in general, they have some sort of a stake in the org, right? So whether they have a service or whether you're a data engineer that cares about the Kafka that is actually this data is going through and so on, you're going to basically just watch this repo, just like any other repo that you would have in the first place, right? You would just basically watch it and see the changes that are happening in there, right? Um, the schema changes would be proposed via PR, nothing super crazy or anything, just a PR and you'll notice it and you'll be like, well, this looks okay. Moving on. That's it. Um, and once it's all merged, well, GitHub usually the easiest thing is like right is to just to basically set up some sort of a notification action or something like that in GitHub that basically will push maybe I don't know an email, PagerDuty, Slack, something. Just it'll push something to tell everyone like hey something happened here. This is a big deal, and basically that notifies all the consumers and producers to know that like ah uh, like again we're talking about stakeholder producers and consumers. Um, that they need to update their services. That like some new version of protobuf, like of the protobuf schemas, have like uh, uh, come out, right? Um, <clears throat> and then the stakeholders see the scheme updates, uh, uh, the scheme update notifications, and they're going to update all their components and stuff, right? Uh, it is uh, really important to note that um, part of this entire PR process is to not allow backwards breaking. Uh, basically incompatible changes. And the thing is that that sounds super complex, but it's totally not, because it just means that you're looking for the color red, meaning that you do not delete stuff. <laughs> That's it. That's all you do. You just do not delete stuff ever from Protobuf. And if you see something red, you don't have to be like a hardcore like architect to be like, 
no, no, no. Like you can't. Like you could just be a ding dong who's just like ah, this does not look right. So anyway, um, it's an opportunity to look very smart. So anyway, um, so that's what you're gonna do, and you're going to want to deploy your consumers first. Um, I think that that's pretty obvious, probably. But it's uh, basically. If you would deploy producers first, there's a chance that your consumers do not have updated schemas yet, so they're going to basically drop data. That's all it is, right? So if your producers are encoding something and adding some sort of fields that uh, your consumers are not aware of, well, it's going to work, but it's just simply going to be like, this is gone. It doesn't exist. So basically, you do your consumers first, then you do your producers. Uh, you can come up with several ways to like announce and say like mm, consumers are done right like that you've finished this process so um, cool producers deploy a new schema well, obviously yeah so after after consumers so and the actual uh, how does this all look in practice really is that uh, what you get is that all the services are ultimately using a common schema everywhere right so it doesn't matter that it's a a data engineering specific service or a platform service or like some DevOps service that is doing something somewhere, you don't care. <laughs> like everybody is using the same exact thing and that's awesome. It's super great because like uh, um, maybe at some point in time, some DevOps person is going to care about like, you know, something that is usually would just, you know, be cared about only by a data engineer, right? That sort of thing. So, um, and this makes sense, right? This is just the general flow, is that the services are going to encode all the ingress data. Um, so that means that like, they're also going to do all the normalization, sanitation, blah, 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 sanitization. Um, and ultimately, they're going to encode that stuff in protobuf. So basically, the final artifact, which is basically everything starts from here, is protobuf. It's like an encoded protobuf piece of data that is sitting on Kafka or whatever, whatever you're using, whether it's RabbitMQ or something. Um, same thing, yeah, services, yeah. So services emit all the data to a data bus. Um, call it a data bus just because, uh, I mean, I look at like Kafka, Pulsar, those sort of things, it's, like, it's essentially like a distributed buffer, really. Um, you know, to dump, to completely take it down to the lowest possible level. That's really what it is, so. Um, yeah, uh, and everybody obviously knows the schema already because there's it's a common schema. So all the consumers know exactly what they're getting. There's no guesswork involved. There's essentially a type switch where you're going to be like, what type of message is this? And there's going to be an enum inside the protobuf that says like, oh, this is a billing message, you know, that sort of thing. So everybody knows exactly what to do. There's no question about, you know, that thing where you go to, I don't know, some person that has some esoteric knowledge that's like, you know, from six years ago uh, about a field. And that's how you decide that like, oh, this is a this is a really important message because it's 46. Like, you know, all that sort of stuff has been established and just thrown away. It's like, it's real. Like everybody can figure this out and you don't need, you know, John or Lizzie to figure this sort of a thing out. Um, so, uh, yeah, consumers, of course, yeah, they do stuff with uh, the actual decoded data. <clears throat> but ultimately, uh, the benefits of this whole entire thing that we've gone through is that, uh, well, there's a single source of truth, right? Uh, everybody knows exactly where stuff is at, and they do not need to hunt down the actual service owner or uh, the, serv the producer or the consumer. You literally just simply look at, uh, you just look at the schemas themselves, and they're very human readable. It's, not, it's, it's better than, I think, than even YAML or something, right? Because it's so incredibly readable in the first place, so. Um, there's no guesswork around the structure of the data. Uh, having uh, been in plenty of places where I've had to write a service, and they're like, oh, just write this billing service. And I have absolutely no idea of what it actually looks like. And what it means is tapping into a data stream of some, some sort, reading for a little bit, and seeing like, ah, oh, they're not filling that part out, <laughs> like, or whatever, and just saying like, ah, I, th I think this is roughly right. Um, and more than likely, it's not going to be right. Like, you're going to, you basically, creating a bunch of throwaway code, right? And uh, this is one way how you say, like, man, you don't need to do any of that, so. Um, no need for normalization, and, and I mean by that, like, that during the encode process, of, yeah, there's going to be normalization and sanitation, uh, sanitization, but the thing is that, like, after that, there's gonna be none of that, and there's only one singular place where it all happens, right? Um, because you're basically, you've come up with a, a common way to do this. Um, there's a cost reduction, that is probably kind of a duh, but uh, I mean, uh, you're dealing with binary encoded, like binary data. So naturally, all those little 
Cody's and, uh, you know, whatever sort of other little braces, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's all gone. It's, it doesn't exist. There's not even like a, like in protobuf, you just have integers for index numbers. That's it. Like one through whatever, 10,000 or 99,000. I don't know. Some huge number in any case. So, uh, and the, the comparison rate is ginormous. Uh, I think at minimum, it's like a 75% reduction in the size of the actual payloads. In an, uh, well, not just the payloads, but the entire event. So, and that has massive ramifications, not just in terms of like, oh man, you're going to use way less memory, but it's going to be the platform folks in this case who are probably going to say thanks because all of a sudden your egress costs are going to be way, way lower, right? Because it's all sitting on in protobuf. So um, there's going to be less bugs. I mean, that's kind of an obvious because uh, you know what to fill out. You cannot fill out something that's not there. It's literally like you can't even specify it. It's literally your code is not going to compile, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but most importantly, I think you're establishing a really solid foundation for the future, right? Uh, I think that that is the piece that Chad was talking about as well, is that uh, you are establishing a way. It's not just uh, you're dealing with your problem at that point in time. You are really making a massive decision for the entire org and basically setting it up for success for later. So it's not just a data problem or like a, it's not just an SRE problem or whatever, uh, security problem. Everybody gets access to this and they can do, uh, you know, they know what to do with this data um, and you don't have to hold any hands, right? So, uh, so that's why, yeah, I think it's a really solid beginning to this entire thing. So, DIY schema discovery uh, and distributed systems, yeah, it's terribly hard. It's, it's insanely hard. <laughs> um, and obviously, the like, well, you could probably guess and see that like the hardest part of all this is uh, <clears throat> is conflict resolution. It's totally that. It's because you need because uh, <clears throat> you can have conflicts that are uh, that are resolvable, and then there's conflicts that are not resolvable. Um, and you need to do it fast, and you need to do it in real time. And uh, yeah, there's so many, like you know, tiny little edge cases around this entire thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're nowhere close to actually getting it, like getting it right. It's it's pretty good, but it still happens like uh, all the time. That something weird just happens. Um, like for instance, I'll give you an example that uh, like what happens like a quick a tiny little example. Like what happens if uh, this is the first time you've ever seen data from this you know from this. Uh, source of truth or whatever, in the, like ever. And uh, so meaning you don't have a, a, like a schema established at all. This is like completely blank slate. You, ha you know nothing. And all of a sudden, you get this blast, like just of like, let's say, 100 messages on one service and 100 messages on another service that came through a load balancer or something like that. And both of them are conflicting. Which one do you pick? <laughs> like, which one is the OK one? Obviously, one of them is OK. Um, so. Because of that, you're going to need some form of conflict resolution in the first place. You're going to need to like DLQs and that sort of thing, and you need to basically weigh what is more important. All of a sudden, you're going to start looking at like, well, what looks like more important data? You know, uh, there's going to be all kinds of things in that. So um, yeah, it's a massive time sink, <clears throat> but um, it's truly necessary only if you have to deal with semi-structured data like JSON, right, or YAML, like anything that is. Semi-structured, right? It's not binary. All right. Um, and I think that in general, this time, instead of trying to go and, and discuss, even the discussion of like, man, should we do this really? It's it's not worth it. <laughs> like, it, try to just avoid it. Like, in all possible, like, contexts, just avoid it altogether because it's, it's such a rabbit hole. Especially, I think, the more senior the engineer is, the more likely they're going to want to like dive deep into this thing because it's a it's kind of a cool problem it really is and it looks at the surface layer it looks like it's actually it's quite solvable um, and it kind of is um, but it's going to be very very difficult it's like uh, just horribly difficult so um, oh yeah and uh, besides that. Uh, this might be an obvious as well, but like when you're talking about protobuf adoption, uh, generally adopting it, uh, well, you're going to need to do organization-wide acceptance right of this entire thing, and that's going to be kind of hard as well. So, um, but there are some times when you might want to do schema discovery, and I think the primary one is that you have absolutely zero control 
like none, over where your data comes from. And meaning that maybe you don't have control over the fact that like establishing this source of truth that you have a Kafka or something like that. Maybe you absolutely need to have, maybe there's only one place where things come from forever and you can't deploy anything new, right? Like maybe you have like, I don't know, everything comes from, through an FTP server and it has CSVs on there and that's it. And uh, because of the GovCloud or some uh, some crazy rules, whatever they have, like you can't deploy a Kafka, you can't do any of that stuff. Well, then maybe you know, this is a thing that you should probably maybe look into. But uh, even then, I would argue to say that it's probably better to like try to figure out, like finagle your way through through this, you know, and talk to the customer and be like, we kind of need this thing in here. So, um, yeah, and uh, even then, I guess that's the, the final piece of this is that like even then, I think you should be wrapping it in protobuf uh, anyways. Like, and by that I mean uh, you're we're talking about like deep uh, deep envelopes. So basically you have like an outside envelope that is protobuf and then inside that there's going to be a field which is just like a byte array. And it's and that one is like who knows what. Maybe it's CSV, I don't know. Like it could be anything in there. And then you can pass that a little bit further downstream, but at least you've already you've established something, right? That like there is some like schema to like the data that you're dealing with instead of just like throwing it over the wall, right? So um and uh, I think this probably is pretty obvious, but adopting proto protobuf um, across uh, uh, in orgs, it's significantly easier to do it in small orgs, like way, way easier, because uh, you can totally just rip the Band-Aid. At a large org, it always uh, has to be essentially like a piecemeal type of adoption where you know you have one service that only cares about this type of data, and it's going to be protobuf, and then it's, it's just a whole massive juggling act and stuff, so, okay. I think that is it. Thank you very much. I am Daniel Sellens, your host, talking about great things. And by the way, listen, um, from all this amazing knowledge that you just got from this guy, um, give a star to this open source project called Plumber, okay? Um, it's a, basically a Swiss army knife if you ever need to deal with like writing to uh, Writing, reading from Kafka to Rabbit to Nats, whatever. Every single possible backend basically is there. Um, like MQTT or something like that, you would just, uh, instead of having to write some throwaway code, well, just use this to easily write to it and read from it and that sort of a thing. And also has a bunch of protobuf support in there as well. Uh, and Thrift, I think, as well. So anyway, that's it. Done. <laughs>